This channel is part of the History Hits Network. From magnificent country houses to monastic ruins. These are the landmarks and treasures that reveal our rich heritage and history. Grand country estates to the factories at the heart of our industrial revolution. These are the buildings, landscapes and stories that uncover Britain's amazing past. It really is living, breathing, isn't it? From the wilds of Snowdonia to the dramatic Dorset coast, join me and a host of celebrities with a passion for the past <laughs> as we explore the riches, treasures and secrets of one of our most loved institutions, the National Trust. From the prehistoric... I have never found anything like this. ...to the present day. Congratulations! The Trust has given us behind-the-scenes and below-stairs access... Are we going right to the ground? ...to some of its finest buildings and locations. There was gold under these hills. We'll meet the people keeping our historic traditions alive. Incredible! And the experts revealing the lives of those who shaped our past. Oh, look at that! It really is a treasure house. This is our heritage, our history. Welcome to the secrets of the National Trust. Today, we have exclusive access to Knoll in Kent. Once one of the most famed and sought after palaces in the country. It was so desirable that King Henry VIII demanded it for his own. But now, after 400 years, this Jacobean giant is under attack from cold, damp and decay. And if something isn't done, its priceless contents could be lost forever. So today, I'll take you behind the scenes on one of the most ambitious conservation projects the Trust has ever undertaken. I'll be getting hands-on with this £20 million restoration and helping the team discover lost places. Are these what they call witch marks? That's correct. Also tonight, magnificent Croom Court reveals some shocking secrets to Annika Rice. It is like a house within a house, isn't it? Within a house, possibly within another house. Joan Bakewell helps to conserve a priceless 300-year-old masterpiece. Now, does the varnish have to come off? And Miriam O'Reilly turns dinosaur hunter on our Jurassic coast. Oh, my giddy aunt. Well, that's been locked inside that rock for 190 million years. <laughs> but before all that... Welcome to Knoll, the largest house in the National Trust. So large, in fact, that it's been described as more of a town than a house. It has more than 360 rooms, seven individual courtyards, and parkland that's overflowing with deer. I'm met by a maze of hallways and rooms inside one of the largest homes I think I've ever seen. A common complaint about this house was that it was just too large and rambling. By the time your dinner had made its way through the labyrinth and of corridors and passages to get to the dining room, it would be stone cold. And let's be honest, nobody really wants salad in February. To find out more about the people who've called this place home, I've come to the Brown Gallery. Now, these long galleries were very useful in Elizabethan and Jacobean times, because when the weather was filthy outside and your clothes would get mucky if you were walking out there, you could come and promenade, perambulate in your long gallery. But more importantly, along the wall, you could put pictures Hang the pictures of your family, your ancestors, people of influence that you claim to know. Ring any bells? Yeah. This was the Jacobean version of Facebook. 
If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. We have tons of exclusive documentaries about the most important people in history that you will not find anywhere else. We work with some of the world's best historians like Susanna Lipscomb, Mary Beard and Tony Robinson, exploring everything from the jobs of Tudor England to the diaries of Queen Victoria. And it's not just documentaries either. We have a network of incredible history podcasts, bringing you new episodes every day. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and at Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code Absolute History at checkout. And it's on this wall that we find some of the most important people in Knowles' history. Much of this property was built from 1456 by Thomas Boucher, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who used it as a lavish country retreat. The scale and size of it made it the envy of many noblemen in the country, even the monarch. And in 1538, the archbishop was forced to give it to King Henry VIII. It passed through several hands until eventually it was sold to Thomas Sackville, the man responsible for the house we see today. The collection of paintings is interesting because it wasn't just their ancestors then, it was, it was people they liked as well. Notable people of the day, yeah. Yeah. Showing off. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the Sackville's legacy that house and collections manager Helen Forbert knows only too well. Thomas Sackville embarked on an enormous building programme till 1608 when he died, um, updating what was probably a very old-fashioned medieval palace. So it's been owned by the Sackvilles since 1603. Yeah. When did Noel start having visitors? Uh, the visited history of Noel goes back probably at least 300 years. At first, I think the kind of people who come would be aristocracy, gentry. By the 18th century, you're getting the sort of polite tourists, the upper middle classes, visiting Noel. And by the 19th century, you're getting clerks from London coming for a day out, having their Saturday afternoon here. I think in the uh, 19th century, at one point, the visitor numbers went up to about 10,000. In the 19th century, in the 1800s, that's a heck of a lot of people. Yeah. But wandering around here in wonderful costumes, you can sort of almost see them parading through these galleries. Yeah, so it became something that everyone could come and see. And how many visitors today? Uh, around about 90 to 100,000 through yeah. the house. And it's this constant wear and tear from millions of visitors over three centuries which has left this ancient property in desperate need of urgent repair. I'm headed to the ballroom, once decorated with some of the country's finest 17th century decorative plasterwork and carved wooden panelling. Today, it's little more than an empty shell. Here to show me around is archaeologist Natalie Cohen. I've been in some pretty spectacular stately homes, but it's not generally this kind of spectacle, Natalie. This is scary. The walls look just like your semi at home, don't they, when you've been stripping it down a bit. It's absolutely dreadful. Why are you doing this? We have an internationally significant collection of furniture, textiles, works of art that is housed in these spaces and we need to improve the conditions in which they are kept. What are your biggest enemies in, in a room like this? Cold, dust and damp. So um, that's part of the reason for this project is to make sure that it's uh, a little bit warmer, that it's quite a lot drier um, and that everything is stable and better lit. But this ancient house wasn't designed to have central heating, so it won't be easy. What's lovely is we've got a door over there, which we do. is transparent. People on the other side looking in, so you've clearly not shut this all off. No, not at all. clearly quite fascinated by yeah. what this It's fantastic, people being able to see in and see the work ongoing. How long is it going to take from start to finish? From start to finish, the whole project uh, in this part of the house is five years. That's, that That's seems awfully... Right are you sure? Because you know what builders are like. I mean, they always take longer than they say. Knowles' once lavish interiors, boasting fine plasterwork and woodwork, were a statement of wealth and power, built by the first Earl of Dorset, Thomas Sackville. As the restoration continues, foreman Dan Morrison is still uncovering evidence of the Earl's earliest design ideas. You can get your little bar just down the back there, and if you gently pop it, you'll just feel it give way shortly. 
Let's all see this. Uh, give away, there it goes. Oh my goodness. And there we go. Wow. Oh, look at that. Love a little trompe l'oeil of spindles painted on the flat wall to look three-dimensional, heading off down the staircases. So it's as if you're hitting the banister and the balustrading higher Exactly, up. and we know we have this in areas of the staircase higher up as well, yeah. where it's still on show. It really is a treasure house, isn't it? It is. Treasure's often hidden behind exactly. other pieces of furniture. Always finding things here. These ancient decorations, now covered up by centuries of new additions, can give us a window into how the house would have once looked. And it's here, between two walls, that archaeologist Natalie has found a 400-year-old hidden passage, and with it, their clearest evidence of Knowles' medieval past. We've only recently just got in here. It's normally not accessible. <laughs> it's pretty inaccessible. <laughs> Well, we can see beams and plaster in between. We can. So what we're looking at here is, is really rather exciting. We're oh. looking at the remnants of the earlier building of the Archbishop's Palace. And um, this is a doorway that's been closed off with doorway. glass and plaster. It is, yeah. So this beautiful, this is beautiful uh, timber-framed oh. door. And um, we've got the, the threshold at the bottom there. Um, it would have led onto the passage that gives onto Stone Court. Oh. So this was once an entrance into the room behind us. What a thought. It's beautiful, isn't it? Glorious. We've got uh, a little bit of evidence for how it was lit. So can you see here we've got... A candle! There's a, ca <laughs> a candle stub actually in there. There's a wick. With a wick, yeah. These marks on the wall here that you can see these are called taper burn marks or ritual burn marks. And in the medieval period, you were to protect your house against the possibility that it might burn down. So what you did was you was you burned a little bit of your house as a kind of inoculation against sort it being... An offering. Yeah, basically, against it being burnt down and completely. So that is just where the flame went, and it's literally the soot mark on the wall, the yeah. charring of the wood. Those burn marks appear all the way along this wall um, and on both sides of the fireplace as well. And so far, it's so, worked. Yes, yes, it's been very <laughs> successful. Fascinating, it really is. This hidden passageway and its medieval door are evidence of a house buried within a house. Covered over with large-scale alterations made by Thomas Sackville. To find out more about how this may have happened, Annika Rice has travelled northwest to one of Britain's most famous landscapes. And home to the spectacular Croom Court. This grand Neo-Palladian home is the work of Lancelot Capability Brown, Britain's most celebrated landscape architect. It's also one of the greatest examples of a house within a house. To the late Georgians, a capability design was a must-have. They all wanted a slice of the action, whether it was a, a beautiful garden, a lake, an exquisite temple in the grounds. But to the select few, those who had literally millions to spare in the equivalent of today's money, well, they could have the lot. Croom was Brown's first architectural project, commissioned in 1751 by the Earl of Coventry. In the 1940s, the family sold the house and it changed hands several times before falling into disrepair. The National Trust are now responsible for its restoration, overseen by Michael Smith. I mean, it really is the outside coming in, which you would imagine with anything that Bram yeah. designs. Yeah, we feel it very strongly in this bay. We're almost inviting ourselves to walk out into the landscape. We've got the cover of the ceiling above us, but the views surround us on every side. Brown, of course, was a gardener, and this was a gardener trying his hand at architecture. Other architects were greatly offended by this. Yes. Um, but Brown, because of his insight into how a parkland would function, creates this incredible harmony. When the Trust started the restoration of Croom Court, like the team working at Knoll, they too made a surprising discovery. 
We're heading into the depths of the 18th century wine cellar. But in here, we perhaps get the best view of the 17th century house, which is hidden inside. Late one evening, in the dying sunlight, we notice a glimmer of light shining through a plastic ventilation grill in the wall. And we thought, that's not right. And we took down the 18th century wall and revealed this 17th century leaded window behind. And it was just the most incredible discovery. We, we didn't expect to find it at all. They were amazed to find that inside Capability Brown's Georgian mansion was a far older Tudor home. His design covered up the original house and made Croom Court fashionable for its day. On the upper floors, we've discovered layer upon layer of historic wallpaper, 18th century ceilings um, that mask 17th century ceilings up above. Down in the basement, Elizabethan bricks forming the floor. It is fantastic. It is like a house within a house, isn't it? Within a house, possibly within another house. And we think there are five houses five on this houses. side, dating all the way back um, to medieval times. And every successive time, they try to give the building a new fashionable exterior. And yet, all those layers of history are still woven into the, the very fabric of this place. model of the house reveals just how much it was changed by Capability Brown. So we can just pull it off? Yeah, and what's starting to come to light is the mansion that Brown found here when he arrived in 1751. This is amazing. So this is what was here This before. is what he found. And if you look behind the tower, it all comes to an end. So we can actually dismantle this in its totality. And then we get this feel for this much more modest brick mansion that was here before Brown arrived. Now you see that, you realise just how audacious Brown was. Yes. To protect his earliest work, the Trust have decided to restore Croom to capability Brown's design, rather than the older home that hides beneath. A mammoth task that will take decades to complete. Hello. Oh, yeah. Are you yeah. Paul? That's it, yeah. I was told to come and find you here. Very nice, nice to, meet, to meet, you. meet you. I'm yeah. Annika. Plasterer Paul Davis has been working here for three years already, and I'm going to lend him a hand. We're sticking to how they did it in the 1700s and using lime plaster with a twist. Can I just ask you, what are the black hairs? That's the horse hair or goat's hair, which will bind it together, and it, 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 it acts Oops. as a binder. OK. Uh, force, force it up as you... Uh, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I feel really pleased that I've just done that. I'm now <laughs> part of the restoration of this entire building. Discoveries like Croom's House Within a House help us understand how Knoll may have been redesigned from 1603 by Thomas Sackville. This home passed through the male side of the family for three centuries, and even when it was given to the trust in 1946, the family retained a 200-year lease on apartments within the house. Here, to give me an insight into what it's like to live at Knoll, is the current Lord, Robert Sackville West. What's it like for you living here, in practical terms? Can you always hear people moving about? Pretty much we can, but more of a worry is the possibility of them uh, hearing us. Uh, you know, our kitchen is sort of right next door to the Great Hall, and yes, we hear people talking in the Great Hall, but they probably equally hear us swearing at each other <laughs> over, uh, over lunch. Uh, so you're saying to your kitchen. children, mind your language, there are visitors in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I've, yeah, the number of times I've said that, yes. <laughs> Robert moved into Knoll in 2008 with his wife and three children. When your children were small, did they take it for granted? I think they did, and they couldn't quite understand one or two things. So, you know, the first summer we moved in here, my youngest daughter was probably about five or so. She came back from school. She was actually full of uh, outrage because she said, uh, my friend Abby, she came to visit Knoll this weekend, last weekend, and she didn't ask me whether she could come or not. I can't go into her house just like that. <laughs> Old places are always about atmosphere to me. What's the atmosphere of Noel? Somebody once said that it simmered rather than sparkled. There is a sort of luster to the place, slightly tarnished, faded glory. 
and part of, I guess, this, this massive restoration project is to stop it falling into decrepitude, but at the same time to preserve that sort of um, faded brilliance. Best moments for you of living in Knoll, when you say to yourself, gosh, I am lucky? It is probably right at the beginning or end of a day when the place is incredibly peaceful. And equally, I like it uh, when it is really humming with people enjoying themselves here as well. So you really enjoy sharing it? Yeah. Up to a point. <laughs> I, I, was, I was thinking about whether to say that. <laughs> Work to update one of the largest properties in England has been underway for over a year now. And while all the work is going on, archaeologists have a small window of opportunity to uncover this house's hidden secrets. You come and lift some floorboards here. I'm joining Natalie upstairs to help delve beneath the floorboards. Yeah, so we are the first people have a proper look under here. Thicker than your, weightier than your average floorboard. Yeah, they definitely are. Building oh my with quality. Oh, goodness, how do you start? There are little things to be found, and this is obviously a thoroughfare, so people are walking through here, dropping things. It's you a can load see tobacco there. packet. Any objects we find here today... Sometimes we found them with little messages inside them. Looking. ...could greatly improve the understanding of this property's rich history. What have we got there? I've got Quercus roba. Excellent. An oak leaf. Have a look in the other void yeah. over here, see what we've got. There's a bit of woodwork here. Look at this. Yep. Or a bit of... A bit of tie of some sort. Yeah, some kind of tie. You know, I could delve it for hours. Yeah, so that's the fun that's of it, see? Oh, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? A bit of clay pipe. A bit of clay pipe. Brilliant. Some of these items may have lain beneath the floorboards for up to four centuries. Yeah, it's even old clay pipe. But to begin the work of dating them exactly, they need to go to the team busy cataloguing all the other discoveries made throughout the house. Are these your workers? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is our archaeology team. Oh, hello, archaeology <laughs> team. <laughs> What's that? So that's um, a piece of textile, and we've even got a tiny little bit of the tassel as well. How old do you guess it is? Well, it could be as early as sort of 18th century. Well, this is probably our, our most exciting find, and this was found by one of the archaeology team. Loving friend. Loving friend, Robert <laughs> Draper. 1633, the date is on here. So what this is is a, uh, an early 17th century letter from, we think, one steward to another, and it's asking to provide various different things, including uh, green fish, which is a kind of salted fish. A snapshot of a bygone age. Absolutely amazing and so clear and in beautiful condition. So we have two fragments of leather shoes. Um, age mid-17th century. One of the Charleses was on the throne when he was One of the Charleses probably. was on the throne, indeed. It's hard to believe that these shoes were last seen some 400 years ago. And were it not for renovations, they might never have been found. While the house is cleared of all furniture, it's hard to recognise just how beautiful these spaces once were. These rooms are normally full of art, but while the contractors have been pulling up floorboards and stripping back wall coverings, the gigantic Raphael paintings that normally occupy these spaces you can see here have also been taken away for conservation. These five-metre-wide paintings, priceless 300-year-old copies of Raphael's original masterpieces, were transported 150 miles away to the Bush and Berry Centre for Art Conservation in Bristol. Joan Bakewell has followed them. It's a delicate job unrolling a 300-year-old painting. Roll it gently back, just go back half a turn. Just right. slowly. 
little bit further. And for this team of world-class art conservators, it's also an extremely exciting time. We can just peek under the corner of the painting here. It must be quite nice, Alan, as a craftsman of today, to see the marks left by craftsmen of centuries ago. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, the most humbling and uh, aspect of the work and something which, uh, you, you know, we respect to the utmost. The experts here deal with millions of pounds worth of art every year, using cutting-edge technology like X-ray and infrared to preserve these precious pieces. Overseeing the work on our Knoll paintings is Tina Sitwell, a conservation advisor with over 25 years' experience. The National Trust, believe it or not, has over 13,000 paintings throughout England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and it's our responsibility to take care of those pictures. And it's because of the poor conditions within Knoll House itself that their current focus is on our six priceless oil paintings. Tina, tell me the background story to these paintings. They're called cool cartoons, but I know they're not jokes. A cartoon is a design or pattern which was used to either make a fresco or tapestries. In 1515, Pope Leo X commissioned Raphael to produce a series of cartoons depicting the acts of St. Peter and St. Paul. They were then used as templates to make tapestries now adorning the walls of the Sistine Chapel. Over a hundred years later, Charles I, King of England, purchased the cartoons and the Knoll House copies were made. And it's here on the canvas that we see evidence of mould, damage caused by the damp conditions at Knoll. Work has already begun on three of the six paintings. Today, expert Alan Bush and I will make a start on their latest arrival. Its surface has been covered with a layer of tissue to protect it during transit and storage. Here you can see the facing tissue which uh, we applied to the paintings when they were at Knoll Park. With the painting unrolled and hung up, Alan can now start removing the tissue. I'm going to have to soften the adhesive and um, I do this by saturating it with the solvent. I just release the edge of the tissue here. That seems to be releasing. It looks very satisfying to do. Can I have a go? Yes, you can. Yes, please do. A little piece here ready to lift Ooh, away. Oh, yes. So Quite there, good paint, isn't it? So there we see the original paint surface, which isn't itself protected by the varnish layer. Now, does the varnish have to come off? Yes, it will. That will be the next stage. Before he can repair the painting, Alan needs to remove the 300-year-old varnish to access the paint underneath. These are relatively mild solvents, and already you can start to see the... Yes, uh, it's changing. ..the improvement there. And there it is on your dirty... There, there we can <laughs> see the discoloured varnish. It took Alan four weeks to remove the varnish from this painting in the series, and the extent of the damage underneath is obvious. It looks as though paint has just peeled off. Yes, it's suffered a lot of damage in the past. You can see strange little island shapes here are, in fact, inlays of canvas, and those now have to be retouched. Nose fluctuating temperatures damp and even woodworm have been destroying objects such as these. And to restore these priceless works of art, experts like Alan also have to be highly skilled artists. So now show me how you would actually put on All your right. restoring paint. I use here the dry ground colours right. and those are mixed with a varnish uh, resin medium. The important thing about using this sort of medium rather than oil paint is the fact that uh, it is readily reversible. When Alan is finished, this set of six paintings will be returned to the warmer, drier conditions within the house, where they can be appreciated once again. Back at Knoll, I'm on the search for a rather special room. 
because while the £20 million overhaul is underway, the vast collection of priceless objects has been moved to this specially constructed storage facility, giving scientists like Dr Nigel Blades a golden opportunity to do some rather unusual research. Wires everywhere. What are you doing here? Well, what we're monitoring these objects for is something called acoustic emission. So these wires actually are attached to tiny microphones that are listening to the wood. Do you know, if it was April the 1st, I'd think, oh, really? Yes. You're listening to the wood. We are listening to the wood. What were you hoping to hear? Well, we're hoping to hear if the wood develops any cracks or micro-fractures, which will happen as you change the environment of the object. <laughs> Can I listen to the... Uh, the table here and see what sound it's By making. By all means. So we've got uh, a sound file which is very much amplified and processed. That noise you've heard there is very small micro fractures happening over time. Amazing to think the table's actually making that noise. But he's also been listening for something else because lurking within this building is a hidden terror. Woodworm. Gosh, they've got a lot of teeth. They have, they have. And the reason the woodworms do so well, or have done so well here, is because it's been very cool. So when we change the heating and bring on the little bit of heat we want to have here, that will actually prevent the woodworm from being active. The wood becomes too dry and the woodworm can't survive in it any longer. And it doesn't matter whether it's a French table or a Dutch chest, the language of the woodworm is the same everywhere, isn't it? That's right. They like the exotic the best sometimes. <laughs> a bit like us on winter holidays. It is. <laughs> Thank you very much. But if that wasn't strange enough, while Nigel's downstairs listening to furniture, another scientist, Cecilia Bembibre, is upstairs cataloguing the smell of books. Now, you see, as a book collector, that, for me, is just the most wonderful smell. It's a good thing for you. It's not such a good thing for the book, because Why? it's the smell of the book dying. No, just the smell of... Yeah, that wonderful smell. Slightly musty. Yes, and slightly sweet and vanilla. It's the smells that it's produced with the degradation of cellulose. Right, so that's actually rotting then, that book. Well, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Slowly. Yes, what good does putting a rotting book in a bell jar do? What are we doing here? Every day we encounter hundreds of smells and they affect our emotions, our thoughts and our behaviour even. And yet, although smell is so important, we don't have a strategy to preserve and protect and archive the smells. So we know very little about the smells of the past. By analysing a book's odour, Cecilia can work out which chemicals are responsible for that glorious old book smell. So this is my This is a visual book, representation yeah. of what's in the book. So basically, this is acetic acid, which smells of vinegar, and this is called benzaldehyde, which is, again, the caramelly smell of an old book. Now I can see how it could work to your advantage. You can now artificially, then, recreate those particular fragrances. Is that right? Well, we have the principle to do it. As a scientist, I have to say it's not such an exact science, uh -huh. but uh, there's a lot of art in perfumery. But yeah, that's the idea. The idea is to archive the smells that are important to us. I've been called up to the attic by archaeologist Natalie Cohen. And we're just going to lift it out and sort of roll it back. Oh, yeah. Because directly above a room built for a royal visit by King James I, she's found evidence of medieval witchcraft. If you have a look down there, oh. can you see we've got like a, a mesh uh, design yes. here? So it's scratched on the timber and also scratched on these uh, floor joists here on either, either side. Are these what they call witch marks? That's correct, yes. It's believed witch marks were put there to keep the king from evil spirits. The idea is that Witches and demons uh, came on currents of air, and they were, they were all around them in the 17th century. 
um, and they were very they could very easily get into a room through an opening so they can get in a window they can get in a door and they can come down a fireplace so these marks are to ward off evil something spirits coming, coming down, the, down chimney. the chimney well i never uh, shall we um, cover it up and keep them out it's been kept safe for so long it would seem rude to uh, it's doing a good job the men oh, come on While Natalie and her team continue to search for lost gems under floorboards, Miriam O'Reilly has travelled to the south coast, searching for treasure of her own. As well as grand old houses, the Trust also cares for 775 miles of coastline and none of it has a more epic story to tell than the Jurassic Coast. Stretching for nearly 100 miles along southern Devon and Dorset, the Jurassic Coast is one of the best places in Britain, in fact, in the world, to find traces of those ancient creatures which lived hundreds of millions of years ago. You just need to know where to look. I'm fossil hunting, and my guide is Sam Scriven, one of the top geologists at this World Heritage Site. The ideal conditions are just after a winter storm during spring tide, so you get a decent low tide after the storm, and you can come out and you can find pockets full of beautiful ammonites. The Jurassic coast is constantly eroding into the sea, revealing more fossilised remains. Charmouth is the best and safest place for geologists like Sam to go hunting. While we've been talking, I've actually spotted something down by your foot. So this is a little limestone pebble. And you can see that little white rectangle there. Yeah. That's the edge of an ammonite that's been fossilized yeah. inside this stone. Ammonites were relatives of the squid and octopus, but had a snail-like shell. And if there's one inside this stone, it will have been there for a very, very long time. OK. Now. Oh, my giddy aunt. So that's the imprint left behind. Oh, that is just a beautiful. Section. OK, isn't it? <gasps> that's been locked inside that rock for 185, 190 million years. You're the first person to ever see it. I've been picking up stones all of my life, and I have never found anything like this. Fossilised ammonites give us an amazing glimpse of life that existed millions of years ago. But there's even more compelling evidence of creatures that once populated these lands. To find out more, I'm heading to a nearby quarry on National Trust land to meet Kevin Keats. His family has been mining limestone here for over 300 years. I'm the 13th generation, my son's the 14th generation. But I've heard limestone isn't the only thing he finds in these hills. We find mostly mussels, fish, shark's teeth, crocodile bones. What's the most unusual fossil you found, Kevin? Well, sometimes we find footprints. But not any old footprints. In 1997, Kevin found one of the largest hauls of dinosaur tracks ever found in the United Kingdom. So this is where Kevin said there are great whopping dinosaur prints. Yep, there are over 100 dinosaur tracks on the surface of the bedrock here. Is that, is that one there? With that's a right. With a hole with a little paddle in it? Yep, that's right. So there are lots of these little dishes and that one's just caught the rain. Ah, oh, and th this is absolutely clear. You can see that this is a footprint. Yeah, so this is the, the round edge of where the weight of the dinosaur would have pressed into the sediment, uh, which would have been a beach by a freshwater lagoon. And it crushed the beach and the shells beneath it, squirging the sediment out from around its mighty foot. And that's the structure that we see. 140 million years ago, a storm or flood would have covered these dinosaur prints in a layer of mud, preserving them. Over millennia, the sediment was compacted into limestone, leaving the dinosaur tracks permanently etched in the rock. What type of dinosaurs were they? Well, based on the age of the rock, they were probably sauropods. 
um, called Brachiosaurus. Um, and these had enormous great long necks and they could be 26 metres from the tip of their tail to the tip of their nose and weigh perhaps 40, 50 tonnes. What do they eat? Oh, plants, absolutely. They're, they're so vegetarians. Were, yeah, they were vegetarians. I'm just trying to imagine by looking at the shape of this imprint um, what it would have been like to kneel by the foot of this dinosaur. <laughs> you, well, you would have been in shade, I would have thought, um, behind these enormous animals. Sauropods, like Brachiosaurus, included as a group the largest animals that have ever walked the Earth. This is the first time I have seen a dinosaur imprint in the place where it was made. And I'm going to do something I have always dreamed of doing, and that is genuinely walking in the footsteps of dinosaurs. Wow. And I couldn't be more excited. It's been a privilege to be part of the ongoing work here as Noel continues to reveal its hidden past. Because with each new discovery, we understand so much more about this mighty house and the people who've owned it. Monarchs, archbishops, and 13 generations of one family. Peter Sackville West, the writer, who lived here until the 1920s, said of Noel, it has the deep inward gaiety of some very old woman who's always been beautiful, who's had many lovers and seen many generations come and go, smiled wisely over their sorrows and their joys. Thanks to the restoration work here, Noel should be able to smile wisely over many generations to come. Next time, I'm in the Lake District, telling the real tale. She was unsqueamish enough to actually skin him of famous author Beatrix Potter. She didn't want to be even called Miss Potter, Beatrix Potter, anymore. Also, Oz Clark gets access to some of the world's rarest plants. And Joan Bakewell stakes a claim to one of the National Trust's most important islands. Congratulations. The first part of the jigsaw.